Oh, no, no, I know better than that. I've been around here long enough. I was giving the guys in the back a chance to get going. All right, folks, let's get going. Welcome back. Thanks for being here. Galatians chapter 4 tonight, chapter 4 tonight. Uh, as always, kind of my little spiel, this is a Women on Mission kind of sponsored Bible study that they've opened up to the church, so we appreciate them. Uh, the kind of the curriculum or what I base it off of is a, on, a free online Bible study from Ray Pritchard at Keep Believing Ministries. He actually does two hours per chapter, and we're condensing it down hopefully within an hour per chapter. Uh, so if you want to see more detail and whatnot, you can go to his website, keepbelieving.com, and watch all of his Bible studies. I'm actually reading the Bible through in a year with him right now. He is reading the Bible on YouTube videos every day and post them at 7 o'clock. And it's been eye-opening because when you're sitting there listening to him read it, and you're also reading it yourself... I don't know, some things have popped out to me that don't typically pop out to me. So it's been a very interesting. Uh, but he posts the videos at 7 o'clock each morning. You can read the Bible with him through in a year. We've already done Genesis, Exodus, 15 chapters in Psalms, Matthew, and Leviticus. I think we're now we're in Numbers. I just read about the red heifer uh, in Numbers. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. So that's been cool. And yeah, just a plug. Uh, since he has them on video on YouTube, you can see easily. I think the shortest reading we had was 14 minutes, and the longest reading we had is 26 minutes. So kind of my point there is, if you can't take 14 to 26 minutes out of your life uh, to read the Word, uh, then we got problems, okay? So that kind of kind of opened that up to me as well. So keep believing ministries. Uh, appreciate him for all this uh, material and what he does, and all he asks for is donations so that he can keep uh, doing these free online studies, and we've already sent a donation uh, to him. Uh, so if you, if, you get, if you feel that you want to give some to him, uh, let me know, and I'll get you the, the info, and you can send it to him, okay? A few things before we get started in Chapter 4. I haven't seen it yet. I hope to try to see it soon. But for those of you that are looking for something to do, I've been told we need to go see Jesus Revolution. You've seen it? You need to go see it. I'm promoting it here. It's in the theater. Hurry up. It's a, it's a Christian film, so it won't be there as long as... Right, so it won't be there as long as, as other movies, but we need to support this and we need to see it. I've heard nothing. Everybody I've talked to that I trust, I've heard nothing but good things about it, and we need to go see that. So go see Jesus Revolution. It was actually supposed to come out earlier, but was de production was delayed due to COVID, okay? And now it's kind of weird. We're kind of looking back on that, and we're wondering, was that God, because of all the revivals that have sparked up at the same time this movie's going, and it fits perfectly uh, in place? In the first five or six minutes of the movie, Ashbury right. is spoken. Right, right. So, so it's very interesting that that film was kind of was supposed to come out earlier, was delayed due to COVID, things they couldn't control, comes out now while we also have this going on, these revivals. Uh, so uh, just go see it. If you, if you need something to do in the afternoon or, or whatnot, go see that, support that, buy the ticket so that we can get more movies like that uh, available to us. Now, speaking of the revival at Ashbury, um, where is that, Kentucky? Um, a lot of people have asked me questions, and it's weird in today's world because you got some people that ask you questions, and they want you to be critical, and then you got some people that ask you questions, and they want you to like fill up the van and go to Kentucky. Um, so here's my stance on it: I hope and pray it's true revival, and I hope and pray it comes here, okay, and starts here. That's my stance on it. I heard someone say we ought to be hopeful, not skeptical. We ought to be discerning, not critical, and we ought to pray, oh God, do it again. And I was um, listening to a podcast the other day, and we were making the point, yeah, if you can load up and drive to Kentucky, great. 
But what we've learned in this Bible study in Galatians is a Christian is a person in whom Christ lives. So we all have Christ right here. We can have a revival right here if we decide we want it. Uh, We don't have to load up and go to Kentucky. The thing that I would point out up there is is they started a chapel service, and they decided they wasn't stopping. And uh, that may be a problem for some of us because we have other things we want to do. Um, So we want revival. Um, It's all based on us. So that's kind of my comments there. But uh, Jesus Revolution, uh, go see it. I'm going to try to go see it as soon as I can. And uh, we can kind of come back and compare notes. One other story I want to tell you that kind of fits into tonight. And something that I've told the young people, you probably saw it on Fox News. It was on Fox News. Um, I'm friends with Patrick Gibson, Benton Gibson's son. You may know him. Uh, He posted the video because his child is in the grade below uh, this boy I'm about to tell you about. Uh, But there was a young man at Starkville Academy, Mississippi, who was on social media. He's 16. He was on Instagram, for you parents that uh, know about Instagram. And all of a sudden, one day, he gets a message, a direct message from a, what appeared, what he could tell on Instagram, was a, a very attractive young woman. And she had done her research. It was like, hey, I know your friend Sally. Uh, she told me I should get to know you and reach out to you. So he starts having this, you know, a relationship, best she can, on direct messaging on Instagram. Well, all of a sudden, one day, as things uh, progressed, she asked him to open up FaceTime so that they could FaceTime each other in Instagram. And, uh, yeah, in Instagram. And uh, during that time, unfortunately, there was obviously some sexual things that went on in this FaceTime video. All the while, he didn't realize that when he opened up that FaceTime, he was being recorded doing this. A sexual act. So then a couple of days go by and he gets a message that says that they have the video and that they have, he has to pay them $1,000 or this video is going out to everybody. Um, so I've talked with my youth about it. Can you imagine the pressure of a 16-year-old needing to come up with 1000 bucks? And he probably don't want to go to his mom and daddy and kind of confess um, but at the same time, he don't want that video to go out there for his teachers and his preacher and his grandma and whoever else may see it. And uh, he got so desperate, they were, they were asking for the money, and he got so desperate, he messaged back to these folks and said, um, I'm just going to kill myself. And they responded and said, good, you're dead already. And that 16-year-old boy who played football and baseball and was a hunter, and went to Starkville Academy, who's kind of in the same league as Park Lane, killed himself. And uh, the FBI tracked the phone, and all this came from Nigeria. It was a setup. Um, They tricked him. They obviously did the research. Um, And, right, he thought it was local, uh, but the FBI tracked it to Nigeria, I believe they are still working on pursuing that. Uh, they, I just, I, all I know is what, what was on the report, that it was from Nigeria. So uh, anyway, I stress that to you, uh, number one, because you got kids and grandkids, and I've stressed it to our, our youth. Uh, We've got to be careful, careful with that. And, uh, you know, because that, that's right here in Mississippi. So that's not too far away. All right. um, I think the only question we kind of left off with last week that I wanted to touch on, I kind of flew through chapter 3, and I apologize. Um, I was excited about chapter 2, and I'm excited about chapter 4. So I kind of just flew through chapter 3. But hopefully you got enough to kind of give you a basis and a foundation as you read and study going forward. But I think the only question that we really... Uh, kind of asked or discussed last week was concerning the 430 years uh, there in that verse, uh, verse 17 of chapter 3. I'm just going to read you here um, what's in this commentary. And you can, I know it's hard for you to, to listen. You probably want to read it yourself. So if you want to get a picture of this before you leave, you can. But let me read this to you. The 430 years of Galatians 3.17 
has puzzled Bible students for many years. For a from Abraham's call to Jacob's arrival in Egypt is 215 years. Um, this may be computed as follows. Abraham was 75 years old when God called him and 100 when Isaac was born. This gives us 25 years. Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born, and Jacob was 130 years old when he arrived in Egypt. Um, thus, 25 plus 60 plus 130 is 215 years. But Moses tells us that Israel sojourned in Egypt 430 years, so the total number of years from Abraham's call to the giving of the law is 645 years, not 430. The length of the stay in Egypt is recorded also in Genesis 15, 13 and Acts 7, 6, where the round figure of 400 years is used. Several solutions has been offered to this puzzle, but perhaps the most satisfying is this. Paul was counting from the time Jacob went into Egypt when God appeared to him and reaffirmed the covenant. The 430 years is the time from God's confirmation of his promise to Jacob until the giving of the law at Sinai. Regardless of what solution to the dating question we may choose, the basic argument is clear. The law given centuries later cannot change a covenant made by other parties. But suppose the later revelation, such as the law of Moses, was greater and more glorious than the earlier. Uh, so basically, best I can, can do for you on the 430 years, but the ultimate point is, is that the law came later, okay? The law came later. Uh, so if you want to get a picture of that or write some of that down before you leave, it's right here. Feel free to do so. Um, so with that, we'll move in to chapter 4. No turning back, Galatians chapter 4. Go ahead, Bo. Let's start with the quiz. Quiz 7. True or false? God always keeps his promises. True. He always keeps his promises but in his own time and in his own way, okay? Number two, a law requires blank, a promise requires blank. A law requires what? Obedience. Perfect. A promise requires faith. Good. Number three, true or false, the law can change my heart. False. It cannot. There, there's some, we can all agree there's some good laws out there, such as uh, the law against drunk driving. Uh, you've heard of people that have had multiple drunk driving uh, issues. Um, uh, the law uh, obviously didn't change their, their heart. Uh, something else does. So. Number four, how do you become a child of God? Faith in Christ alone, that boy. Number five, and it's multiple choice for you. Who are the true sons of Abraham? Uncircumcised Jews, Jewish by birth, circumcised Gentiles, or believers in Jesus? Believers in Jesus, D as in dog. Extra credit. What do you do when you see a wet paint do not touch sign? Or what do you want to do, right? And we were talking about that sign as kind of an example of the law. The law doesn't make us a sinner but the law reveals the sin already in us because if there was a wet paint sign on the wall over there, Slade wouldn't even pay attention to me tonight because he's sitting there going, how can I bump into that on my way out and see if it's really wet, right? Uh, so that's kind of what that reveals. Um, as always, Galatians, the book of Galatians, is about getting the gospel right. And the reason that's so important is because if we get it wrong, two terrible things happen. Sinners aren't saved and God is not glorified. Okay, how does one become right with God? <coughs> Faith in Christ alone, that's right. If, if, if we're still missing this uh, now, then, then we may have to start over. Because um, that's the whole point. Next slide, Bo. Uh, here's the picture of justification for you. Just kind of want to put that back up there. Uh, justification, if you hear the doctrine of justification, I tell the youth it's a big word. It's something they don't use on a daily basis. Uh, but as they hear it going forward in life, what they need to remember is that is when our guilt is credited to Jesus and what he did on the cross, and his righteousness comes to us. We're declared uh, not guilty at that time, okay? The doctrine of justification. 
the moment we come to Christ, our sin is credited to Jesus and his righteousness is credited to us. This could also be called the great swap. Okay, We're swapping here. We're giving him our guilt and, uh, and he's giving us righteousness. Okay, So today's lesson is titled, No Turning Back. No Turning Back. See, the Galatians were tempted uh, to turn back. They were tempted to turn back from fellowship with other believers. They were tempted to turn back from public confession. They were tempted to turn back from church, from the gospel, from the gospel of salvation by grace through faith um, because uh, of what kind of what they were tempted to turn back to the law, okay, after uh, Paul had been there and when those Judaizers came in there and kind of tricked them, kind of bewitched them, uh, I think is what the scripture said. Uh, so that's kind of why our, our lesson, this first half of chapter 4 is titled No Turning Back. So we need to remember here, circumcision uh, was the door to the whole wall, okay? If you start down that road, um, you can't stop with just circumcision. Uh, we talked about it this morning. It actually lined up great in our youth uh, Sunday school lesson this morning. Um, if you had, just say if you take two laws, do not commit adultery and do not murder, okay? If, if I do not cheat on my spouse and do not commit adultery, but I kill Slade tonight, what am I? Guilty, right? Uh, just because I, I didn't break one or broke the other, I'm still guilty. I've still basically broke them all. So what Paul was telling these, these baby Christians, these, these mostly Gentile Christians was that uh, if you turn back to circumcision, you're basically taking the whole, you're going back and taking the whole law, okay? You can't just pick that one thing. Um, so tonight, uh, this first, the first half uh, tonight, we're going to talk about um, the problem of a Christian and his doubts, okay, and his doubts. Um, if anybody sits, sits here and says they've never doubted uh, before, they're probably lying, okay? Um, uh, but uh, I also realize this doubt is not something that we typically talk about in the church. Everybody's kind of scared of, of doubt, okay? So... This is a problem a lot of people face, and it's kind of a hidden problem in the church today because we don't talk about it. But I want to tell you it is perfectly biblical. Uh, if, you, if you've read your Bible, if you've studied your Bible, doubt is perfectly biblical. You see doubt in Psalms. You see doubt in Job. You see doubt in Ecclesiastes. A little bit later tonight, I'm going to tell you about certain people that you see doubt uh, with. So it's a biblical subject and something we're going to kind of touch on tonight. And I, br I bring this up, and this is kind of why, to be completely honest with you, kind of why we ended up in this book and why we decided to do Galatians. And here's why. Back in, it was when we were going to Judgment House. When was that, October? I guess Halloween. Uh, we were going to Judgment House at, at Tyler Town Baptist Church. And that morning before we left, I put a, like, a survey or question on our board down there. And I gave all the youth a piece of paper. And I said, do not write your name on it. You're going to answer this question with a number. You're going to fold it up, and you're going to go over there and put it in a box. That's all I want you to do. No name. I don't know who you are. Just want your answer. Be truthful. Put your answer on a piece of paper. Throw it in that box over there. I'll look at it later. Okay? The question was, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being not sure at all, okay, and 10 being certain. Make sense? One, not sure at all. Ten, being certain. If you were to die today, are you going to heaven? Write it down. Luckily, we had 17 that morning in Sunday school. We would have beat the adult three today if they'd all showed up. And here's the results. On a scale of one to ten, if you were to die today, are you going to heaven? Here's your results. I don't know the names. All I know is the numbers. Remember, we had 17 uh, in Sunday school that morning. Three of them gave it a five. Fifty-fifty. We wreck on the way out of here, flip a coin. That's our confidence level. Three more gave it a six. We just, just over fifty-fifty. Five gave it a seven. Two gave it an eight. And only 4 out of 17 gave it a 10. Three fives, three sixes, five sevens, two eights, 
four tens. Um, luckily, when we went to Judgment House that night, um, Jesus reached out to Rowdy Pete. Rowdy Pete answered the call. So really all we got to deal with is 16 more, okay, because we got that one handled. Um, but anyway, I bring this up. I, I set them down the next Wednesday night and just kind of had a roundtable discussion. And I asked them, I was like, why, why do we have these answers? Why did you answer like this? And one of our seniors said, it just seems too easy. That all we have to do is believe in Jesus. That's it. We don't have, we, we don't have to do anything else. It just seems too easy. Um, another boy spoke up and said, well, you know, I see on TikTok that heaven and hell isn't real. God and the devil's not real. So why am I worried with it? If you had any idea how many hours in the night, late at night, last night I was on my back porch until 1230 responding to your children and grandchildren to things they see on TikTok. If you knew how many hours I put into that, you would take their phones away right now. But here's the, here's the fine line that I'm in. I have to handle it because that's my job as a minister. I can't run to you and be like, you got to take Slade's phone away. Dude's losing it. Because if I do that, what do I lose from Slade? His trust. Okay? So these, these are issues. I'm just throwing it out there. Try to pay attention. These are issues that we deal with on a daily basis. If you had any idea how many paragraphs, because all they want to do is, is, is text or snap, so I have to sit there and type it, um, how many hours I put into trying to respond <laughs> To, to some of that stuff they see on TikTok. So I just want to give you those answers. That's, that's the status of our youth group. Uh, seven, uh, 17 that morning. Uh, three were fives, three were six, five were seven, two were eights, and four were ten. So it's an area of, of prayer. It's an area of concern. Um, and we're going, to do, we're going to do the best we can and, and, um, and, and hope, pray that um, their eyes will be open and that uh, God's light will shine through. And we can kind of satisfy that. So that is the whole ultimate reason we ended up in the book of Galatians. Just tell you. It wasn't something that the women on missions were like, we really want to study Galatians. You know, uh, Galatians really wasn't that popular coming off of uh, Revelation, was it? You know, because Revelation, it was every night and every verse was just so intriguing and so many questions and so much discussion. And uh, so I know Galatians was like not as a big deal, but that's why we ended up there. Uh, was to kind of address this with our young people. So, inside the church, we don't talk about doubt because we have some wrong ideas about doubt. We think doubt is the opposite of faith, and that's not necessarily true. The opposite of faith is unbelief, okay? Um, the opposite of faith is unbelief. So, it's not necessarily doubt. Unbelief is the conviction that what God has said is untrue, okay? Doubt refers to the inner uncertainty usually called, usually caused by difficult circumstances of life. So doubt refers to the inner uncertainty, which sometimes, usually, is called by some difficult circumstance of life. If, um, in our young people, if their parents split up, um, if um, a loved one's diagnosed with cancer, if they lose a teenage friend, uh, that may start uh, causing them to doubt some things. That makes sense? So uh, doubt is that inner uncertainty sometimes uh, caused by difficult circumstances of life. Some people think that doubt is the unforgivable sin. Um, I do not think that. Okay? Abraham struggled with God, if you go back and read. Sarah definitely had her doubts about having a child at 100, correct? Uh, David cried out. Lord, I'm looking for you. Job tried to find the Lord. Oh, and who's the one in the New Testament that's got the word doubt in his name? What you call him? Doubting Thomas. You know, I won't believe until I see the holes uh, there. Um, so, uh, if doubt is a sin, it's not the unforgivable sin, okay? Some people think if you struggle with doubt that you aren't saved. Um, 
I don't, I don't necessarily believe that. I think if you're struggling spiritually tonight, that's not a bad sign. That's a good sign. That's a sign your faith is alive and well and real, and you're trying to find a solid, you're trying to find solid ground for your faith, uh, typically because of the difficulty and pain of living in a fallen world, okay? Um, so I think if you're doubting things, especially in our young people, if they're doubting things, if they're trying to figure things out, uh, they're really just trying to get a solid ground uh, for their faith. Um, for their faith there. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not saved, okay? So the passage in Galatians 4 is going to help us answer the question, how do we know? How do we know that we know? Where's that assurance, okay? How do we know that we're genuinely born again? How um, do we win the bout with doubt, okay? So here, before we get in verse 1, Paul is continuing with arguments made based on our new position in Christ, he begins not with where we are, but how we used to be. So when we start this verse 1, remember this. He's continuing with his arguments uh, based on our new position in Christ, our new relationship with Christ. Remember, we, we ended up last week that we are sons, okay? We are heirs. Um, we, we were written, written into the will, uh, and, our, and our promise and our, our inheritance is going to come later. Uh, that's kind of that position that we're in, so... He, he begins not with where we are, but how we used to be uh, when we pick up here in verse 1. So, chapter four, 4, verse 1. Now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Okay? Paul has just said, if you have faith, you are Abraham's seed, and you are an heir to all the promises God has made. We are written into that will, okay? So what Paul is illustrating here, he's saying it's like a son or daughter with super rich parents, okay? Say you were the, the son or daughter of Elon Musk or Warren Buffett, okay? And you've been written into the will, uh, so whenever they die, you're going to get that inheritance. You're an heir, okay? Uh, so that's kind of what he's illustrating here, uh, that, we, that we're written into the will, the promises that God made to Abraham, we're going to get, and that we're going to get that uh, inheritance in the future. Okay? As a child, you are no different from a slave because you can't get it all then. I told you last week that when we wrote our will, if something were to happen to both me and Kayla, uh, the money's going in a trust, and Amelia and Kenna, and now the future one, uh, can't get it until they're 25. Okay? We put that. So but until they're 25, they're basically slaves. They can't. They can't get it all, even though they own it all, okay? But at 25, they're going to get that. So that's kind of what we're seeing, what he's illustrating here in verse 1. Verse 2, instead, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father, okay? Those guardian and trustees, kind of like the tutor we talked about last week, uh, these were typically brilliant, highly educated slaves, and they were servants of the family. And what they would do, they would raise your kids, okay, for you until a time set by the father. Uh, say the father said, okay, at 16, you're a man, you know, go. Whatever that time was, uh, the, these slaves, these, these brilliant slaves would raise these kids up, get them to where uh, they were raised and, and uh, could operate in life. And at that time, whether it was 16, 18, you know, or whatever it is today, the time the father is set, then, then they... You know, they're subject to that until that time, okay? Uh, so we're still kind of working on this illustration about this will and this inheritance of being a heir, an heir, sorry. In this, uh, verse 3, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. Uh, so before we came to Christ, okay, we were in slavery. But we're heirs today, okay? If you know Jesus, you have a great future, we are heirs, but the best is yet to come, okay? Meaning uh, we're heirs, we're going to own everything uh, in the future, but that hasn't happened yet, okay? Paul is saying there was a time when we all were living in slavery. We were bound by the world. The law enslaved us because it condemned us, but it could not save us, okay? Next slide, Bo. Point this out. Here is a good point I want to make here. A child of the king shouldn't live like a slave 
of the world, okay? So we're, we're heirs, okay, uh, now. We're no longer slave to the world and the law and those things that condemn us. We are now heirs. We're promised that in the future. Uh, we're like, and we talked about it last week, uh, Brother James's translation said children of God. I pointed out that I liked son, uh, sons of God because in that first century, the, the ones who typically got the most inheritance or the majority of the inheritance was the firstborn son, okay? Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a female or male thing. You're, you're all, we're all spiritually equal. Whether you're female or male here tonight, uh, it's kind of like being that, that eldest son, that oldest son uh, that's, that's getting the majority of that inheritance, okay? Uh, that you're an heir there. Verses 4 and 5, I'm going to read both of them together. Uh, these may be two of the greatest verses in all the New Testament, and they kind of don't get, um, get the credit they deserve. But let's read these two verses, four, 4 and 5. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Okay? Um, there's, uh, the, the time had fully come. There's been... The, the time has fully come is kind of like talking about a, a pregnant woman in the latter stages of birth, okay? Uh, the, this pregnant history, this God's story. Uh, you know, at Christmas we talk about, we, we sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, okay? So this is talking about when that time had fully come, when we're, le- when we're in the later stages of the birth and the birth pains here uh, is what we're talking about. So let's kind of break this down. When the time had come to completion, God sent his son, which was who? Jesus, born of a woman, which was who? Mary, born under the law, which means what? Jesus was a what? A Jew, correct? To redeem, there's that word redeem. Remember, we get that word from the slave market. If there was a slave at the slave market that you went and paid the price, you would set them free. Uh, That's kind of the word used here. To redeem those under the law, okay, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So two great verses there that kind of that kind of hide in Galatians that you can highlight there and go back to. Next slide. There's been some uh some discussion of biblical scholars, uh, people a lot smarter than me that have tried to study this when the time had fully come and uh when Jesus came uh the first time kind of what was going on or what what was what the world was like uh, then. And here's some points that we're just, uh, we'll make in passing here. The Pax Romana, um, Pax means peace, okay? So uh, Roman, of course. Uh, so w- what it's talking about during, in this time, there was relatively a time of peace, okay? Uh, the Roman Empire was big. Not many folks were going up against them. It was a relative time of peace when Jesus came. Number two, the Greek language. Um, yes, there was, there was some other little languages out there, for, but for the most part, The Greek language was the common language. Uh, So we see we were in relative peace, and we had a common language in the Greek language. Then we had the Roman road system. Some of those roads that were built uh, thousands of years ago, uh, you can still get on some of those today or see some of those today. It's how well they were were done. Well, during this time, you had that Roman road system. So when Jesus came and and his disciples, the word could spread. They could spread the word because of this road system. Uh, get it out there. Uh, the Old Testament predictions. Uh, you know Christmas, the star, uh, star of Bethlehem, the wise man, the magi. Um, these Old Testament predictions, you know, the magi show up. Uh, we think, we're almost certain they were Persian. Uh, and they show up and they're like, we've seen his star in the east. Uh, well, how do they know that? How do they know to look for that? We had these Old Testament predictions. Uh, some think it's because of Daniel. Uh, you know, Daniel... Um, there in Daniel 5, 11, he was ahead of all those uh, folks. Um, you know, so they had these Old Testament predictions they were looking for. And then finally, restless expectation. Uh, so the moral system had collapsed, okay? It was an idol factory. Um, you think, I didn't live back then, I'm just going based on readings, that you think things are bad now. They were really bad here, okay? And the people were looking for for hope and deliverance. So there were just some things 
that had taken place and then when the scholars study when the time had fully come just some things to think about there okay god sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law so he was fully god fully man and the only one who could save us here here's pretty interesting who gave the law to moses god okay and jesus was who Right, basically God in human form there, okay? Um, so what we see here, the lawgiver, the one who gave the law, is now humbling himself and goes under the law when he's born as a Jew, okay? So he who was over the law voluntarily went under the law, okay? He went under there to get the rest of us out from under it. So, so it's pretty, pretty uh, fascinating when we think about it. Uh, the one who ultimately gave the law is now being born under the law to get us out of it. The lawgiver, the one who gave the law, was now treated as a lawbreaker whenever he was crucified. Okay? The law condemned Jesus so we would be condemned no more. That's the great swap. That's where our guilt is credited to him, his righteousness credited to us. The lawgiver who gave the law, is now being born under the law as a Jew to get you and I out from under it, and he was condemned and punished as a lawbreaker, and ultimately he's the one that gave the law. Okay? Fascinating stuff there. Remember the word justify? Sorry. The word justify comes from the courtroom word to declare righteous. The word redeemed, as we just talked about, came from the slave market. Jesus pays with his blood to set us free. So when you come to Christ, you are not only given new life, not only born again, but you are adopted into the family of God, and you come into the family of God as a first-class citizen. God has no second-class children. We can all come in on the basis of spiritual equality. Okay? Our relationship with God is not based on performance. Uh, it's based on grace. We will sin. We will mess up. Okay, God will not disown us, okay, but he'll help us. And we see that in the, in the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, if you go back and study that. So once a son, always a son. Verse 6, and because you were sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, so but because we are sons, the Holy Spirit is in us. So we, we said the definition of a Christian is what? A person in whom Christ lives, right? So where that Holy Spirit comes into us here. So a Christian is a person in whom Christ uh, lives. Uh, so that's why we say um, Christ is here right now. Okay, we could have revival right now. If you if you're if you're a Christian and you're going to a public school, Christ is now in the school. Okay, um, Christ is right here. Okay, and what Paul is telling us is how great that is. Because when we're going through bad times, uh, when we need something at any time, we can say, Abba, Father, uh, he's here with us. You can do it while you're in the shower, while you're on the toilet, while you're in the prison cell, okay? You can call out and say, Father, okay? That relationship uh, with him there. Verse 7, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. So we're no longer a slave, we're a son, uh, and we're an heir, uh, to those promises that we're going to get later. So, Bo, next slide. What we see here is what we gain in Christ. Slaves have a master, okay? So under the law, as, as slaves, enslaved, you have a master. But sons have a father, okay? Abba Father. We can come to him at any time, okay? So uh, people struggle here. Some people don't feel worthy, uh, we all sin. We all feel guilty. Uh, some people think they have failed. They think God is angry at them. Uh, we worry, how can we be a Christian and still act like this uh, sometimes? And what Paul is saying here, look, the Holy Spirit has been sent to you, and you can all say, Abba, Father, okay? Uh, you can come to him and say, Daddy, Father, whatever, however you want to address him, he is not a distant God, okay? He is not a distant God. When you come to God... 
We can come to God anytime just the way we are and say what we want and he'll listen to you. Okay? He will not turn you away. When you are worried, when you are in trouble, uh, like I was telling the youth when we were talking about the, the young boy at Starkville Academy, when you are worried, when you are in trouble, when, when you're fearful, okay, when you're doubting, uh, when the sky is falling around you, go to God. Abba Father. He's right there with you, okay? If all this is true, why in the world would you turn back? If, you, if Christ is in you, and you can say, Abba, Father, uh, why would you turn back? Why would you turn back to the law? Uh, why would you turn back to that? It's kind of what Paul is saying here. Verse 8. But in the past, since you didn't know God, you were enslaved to things that by nature are not God's. Okay? So formerly, meaning before you came to Christ, okay? so he's talking to baby Gentile Christians. He, he's saying, you know, originally as a Gentile, remember these are baby Gentile Christians, majority of them, um, they were enslaved to idols, okay? They weren't under the law because they weren't Jews, okay? But they were kind of pagan worshipers, okay? Uh, they, they, they worshiped things such as food, sex, pleasure, nature, wood, stone, metal, depending on what they made their, their idols out of. So uh, what he's saying is you were enslaved by these idols, okay? When he was talking to these these baby uh, Gentile Christians. Verse 9. But now, since you know God, or rather have become known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elements? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? So, you know God, why turn back? You are in the wheel, you're an heir, you're getting everything in the future. Why turn back to the idols of the world? Why go back to the drugs? Why go back to the alcohol? pornography, immorality, evil. Do you want to be enslaved by these things all over again? It's kind of the thought here in verse 9. Verse 10, and sorry, I'm, if, just stop me if you need to stop. I'm just going because I'm, I'm behind time-wise. And Tommy's about to start mumbling. Um, verse 10, you are observing special days, months, seasons, and years, Okay? So basically here, uh, just real quick, uh, we have holidays, okay? Uh, th these folks, uh, they had been, you know, uh, observing certain days, certain weeks. They were fasting at certain times, y you know, whatever. We celebrate holidays, Christmas, Easter, uh, whatever. Ultimately, what we're getting here is it's not wrong to have those holidays, Okay. It's not wrong to celebrate those holidays. I know there's some, I've had some people come up to me, uh, why do we celebrate Christmas here? Why don't we celebrate it here? Why is Easter like this? Listen, it, it, ultimately, it don't matter. Uh, my thoughts are as long as there's a day set aside where we are, we are remembering that, worshiping that, then, then great. But what Paul is saying here, uh, it's not wrong to have holidays. But if you, if, but if you think observing that holiday, okay, is going to get you favor with God, okay, then, then you're kind of screwing up, right? So it's not bad to have holidays. We need holidays to remember those things, but don't think that you're just going to go through the motions on, on Christmas Day or the Christmas Eve service to find favor with God, okay? Verse 11, I am fearful for you, and perhaps my labor for you has been wasted. Uh, so he says, I, I fear for you, okay? Um, we are all born into spiritual slavery. We are all born into sin. Uh, we will never get free on our own. Christ came to set us free. And once we know Jesus, we have full rights in God's family. We're, we're the son. We're the heir. God doesn't play favorites. The youngest or least taught Christian is equal to the Christian uh, who's been studying for 70 years, okay? Or has been taught for 70 years. We can come to God any time. If God gives us all that, why in the world would we go back to our old life? We left that, leave it there, enjoy your freedom, and don't come back. Okay? Sin causes us to doubt that God loves us. Sin makes the world look good. Sin tempts us to go back. When you are tempted to go back, when you are tempted to give up, when you are tempted to give in to the anger, bitterness, cursing, blasphemy, hatred, prejudice, theft, or immorality, greed, etc., Tell the devil, take a hike, OK? 
Okay? Martin Luther uh, says uh, to take God's promises, the things that you were promised, take the God's promises and throw them in the devil's face. Throw it in the devil's face and, and say something so, kind of like this. Devil, you're right. I'm a sinner. I'm a lawbreaker. I don't deny it. Jesus paid the price for all my sins. My Lord went under the law for me. He paid the debt he didn't owe. Now I'm free. Go away, devil, because I'm a child of God, a son of God. You have no claim on me. Okay, just something to think about uh, when, when you're... When you're, when you're tempted to go back, to turn back in that old lifestyle, when you're tempted there to doubt, uh, throw the promises of God in the devil's face. Okay, Stand on the promises of God. Run to the cross daily. Jesus overcame sin, death, law, and every evil. He is seated at the right hand of God. As long as he is there, you have nothing to fear. Okay, You want to be happy today? Remember who saved you. You want to rejoice today? Remember where you were before Jesus found you. You want to be free from despair? Remember you are a child of God. You want to be free from fear? Remember you are forgiven. Stand on the promises of God and fight it out with doubt. Say, I'm a child of God. Jesus loves me. Jesus died for me. The Holy Spirit lives within me. God is for me. The devil can't defeat me. I am right with God. Christ declares me righteous. I'll tell the world that Jesus is mine, okay? I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. If you look to yourself, you're a doubt. But if you look to Jesus, doubt will fly away. Doubt yourself all you want, but never doubt the Lord. No turning back. That's the first section of chapter 4. I kind of ran out of time and flew through that. Any comments, opinions, tomatoes? If not, we'll see how much we can get going, Bo. Uh, a tale of two women. This is my favorite part uh, of chapter 4, the second half. A tale of two women. You'll see here in this picture, um, now th this is not in biblical clothes. This is kind of a European dress. But the man there kind of represents Abraham. All right, And the older woman there in the middle is representing Sarah. And then the younger woman there is representing Hagar. Okay, and you can just look, you probably can't see it, but if you, if you were to have my computer up in front of you, you'd see the look on Abraham's face like, you sure this is okay? Okay, because that's where we're going here, if you know that story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. That's where we're going, a tale of two women, uh, the, the, the remainder of chapter 4. But before we get there, let's take a quiz, Bo. Number one, a child of the king should not live like a blank of the world. Slave, good. Number two, slaves have a, sons have a father, good. Number three, how did God prepare the world for the coming of Christ? This is kind of hard, but. Okay, kind of, predictions kind of right. Your, what, what we had here was the time had fully come, okay? The, the birth pains, the, that time had fully come was what we were looking for there. That was hard. Number four. True or false? Once a son, always a son. True. Number five, to redeem means to set free by the payment of a price. Extra credit. What does it mean to call God Father? Now, everybody's going to have a different answer to this, but let's just, let's just sum it up. What does it mean to you to be able to call God Father? It means you're an heir means he's close, he's not distant, okay? And means that the God of the universe, the creator of everything, knows Rodney and knows Madeline and knows Brent, knows Slade. Uh, that's a good feeling, right? Good feeling. He's not distant. He's with you at all times. You can call out Abba Father. Uh, he is not a distant God, okay? All right, as you know, Galatians is all about getting the gospel right. The reason it's important, because when we get it wrong, two things happen. Sinners are not saved, and God is not glorified. Uh, where we left off, Paul was saying, um, you were enslaved. If you were a Jew, you were enslaved by the law. If you were a Gentile, you were enslaved by idolatry, okay, the idols. Um, and Paul is saying, you have been set free. Why in the world would you ever go back to that kind of slavery? Paul said, I don't get it. 
Um, you are keeping days, months, weeks, and years. Um, you're adopting that. Um, you're thinking that if you keep the, this day or this month or you fast for this long, um, as if there is something you can do in your religion to gain God's favor. So if you're if you're if you're re- using those, if you're if you're um, you know fasting on this day or celebrating this day, if you're doing that just to gain uh, God's favor, uh, Paul is wondering here just to kind of give you a, a little little intro before we get into the verses. Paul is wondering here: Did me and Barnabas waste our time uh, when we came to you? Uh, so now Paul is going to make a personal appeal. Uh, He's going to make a personal appeal in this section. And this section of chapter 4 has two parts. The first part is a personal appeal. The second part is a scriptural allegory. Okay, first part, a personal appeal. Second part, a scriptural allegory. This section of scripture, I believe, is the most emotional uh, Paul ever gets in the New Testament. If you kind of study his his letters and his writings in the New Testament, uh, this may be his most emotional uh, in this portion here, okay? Uh, Paul here, as he's writing, is like a parent, okay? He's like a parent in pain. Have you ever had a loved one um, that you knew was going down a bad path or fixing to make a bad decision, um, and you appealed to them, Okay? But you knew that appealing to them, or when you appealed to them, it really put a strain on your relationship. Okay, everybody's been there. Uh, this is kind of the emotion that Paul's feeling. He, he's, he's got the pain of a parent. Uh, he sees them kind of going down the wrong path, and he's trying to appeal to them uh, and worried about uh, straining that relationship. Paul looks at the Galatians, and he sees themselves. He sees himself as their spiritual father, and he sees them. Uh, committing a potential disaster, and he wants to stop them before they go off the cliff spiritually. So that's just kind of an intro before we get into verse 12. Verse 12, I beg you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I also became like you. You have not wronged me, okay? So he's, he's begging, I beg you, or I plead with you, okay? Uh, he's reminding them of their past relationship. He's reminding them of when, of when he was there, um, um, when he preached to them what they did for him, as we'll get to in just a moment in the scripture. He's kind of he's setting this, I beg, I plead with you. He's being emotional here. He's reminding them of their relationship with each other. Verse 13, you know that previously I preached the gospel to you because of a weakness of the flesh. Or your translation may say because of an illness. Okay, this is uh, this is interesting because we don't get this in Acts about this this weakness or this illness. Okay, we don't get this in Acts. We're not sure about this illness uh, that he had. It's only mentioned here in Galatians. Um, we're not sure about it. Some think that he may have gotten malaria because in that time the uh, area that he was traveling was kind of a marshland, and some think that he may have gotten mar- malaria and was really sick. So this is interesting here in verse 13. Uh, you know that previously I preached the gospel to you because of a weakness of the flesh. So it's almost like uh, he got sick. Uh, that's how he ended up there. They cared for him. Uh, so something to, to kind of highlight there in further study. It's interesting that it's only mentioned there. Verse 14. You did not despise or reject me, though my physical condition was a trial for you. On the contrary, you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. So what he's saying is, I was sick. I was a burden to you, okay? But uh, you did not despise me. You did not uh, reject me, okay? Uh, You did not treat me with contempt or scorn. You welcomed me as if I was Christ Jesus, um, so Paul is really getting emotional here. He's tying back into his relationship with them. He's like a parent in pain, trying to keep them from making a bad decision. And, and that's how we're going here. It's as if Paul is saying, I don't get it. You loved me once, okay? Why are we dealing with this now? That's, that's kind of what, what Paul is saying as he's writing this um, in response to them kind of being circumcised. Um, he's, he's building on their relationship. Verse 15, there then 
well, sorry, where then is your blessing? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Okay? So where then is your blessing? What has happened to all your joy? So what he's saying is when I was there the first time, I was sick. Uh, you did not scorn me. You helped me. Um, I can testify if it were possible, you would have torn out your eyes and given them uh, to me here. Uh, he's just talking about how he was welcomed, how they took care of him. He was a burden to them, but they, they, were, they were still uh, with him. They loved him. So he's building up on this relationship, a personal appeal. Verse 16, so then have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? Have I become your enemy now because I told you the truth? Here's a good question, a question that Paul was facing with the Galatians and a question that you and I face today in America. How do you speak truth to people who don't want to hear it? How do you speak truth to people who don't want to hear it? This was, a, this was the problem Paul was facing in Galatia. It's the problem we're facing today in America. Truth sounds like hate to those who hate truth. And I'm sorry, Bo, I skipped. You can go to that next slide. Give them time to see it. Go back to the, uh, yeah, there we go. It's kind of like this, you know. The guy's over there as a wolf behind the sheep, and he's like, danger, danger, wolf. But then the sheep come after him and say, troublemaker. Okay? How do you go to someone and tell them the truth when they don't want to hear it? And then next slide, Bo. Truth sounds like hate to those who, who hate truth. You know, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but a lot of times, uh, it's sad, but a lot of times as a Christian, your greatest opposition is religionist. People in the religion. Um, think about, you know, who, who, was, who were the ones that got Jesus convicted, basically? It's the religious leaders. Um, so sometimes your greatest opposition is going to be these religionists. Uh, verse 17, they court you eagerly, but not for good. They want to exclude you from me so that you would pursue them. Okay? They court you eagerly. This is the Judaizers. Okay? They're courting you. Okay? They're zealous to win you over, but they're up to no good. So what Paul is saying here, you know, they're coming after you. They're eagerly courting you. They want you. They want to win you over, but they're up to no good. He's, he's appealing to them, trying to keep them from going down this road. Verse 18, but it is always good to be pursued in a good manner and not just when I am with you. What Paul is saying here, it's good to be pursued. Everybody likes being pursued. It's good to be zealous, okay? Um, but, you know, these guys aren't good for you. Uh, you. Right here, we'll just make a note. You want a, you want a wrong, you want a warning sign of a false leader? A warning sign of a false leader would be someone who wants to dominate and control area, every area of your life. Someone who must always be in control. Uh, you can think back to some of these cults uh, that's out there. Someone who always wants to be in control, wants to control every area of your life. That may be a warning sign of a false leader, a false teacher. Verse 19. You're ahead of me, Bo. Good job. Um, verse 19. My children, I am again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. Um, so now he's calling them my children. Last week he said, I think it was last week, he said that, you know, you fools, you dear idiots, is what he was telling them last week. And then now he's like, my children. So it says he, he called them fools, dear idiots. Now we see his deepest feeling. My children, my dear children. As if he personally gave birth, okay? As if he was, was in labor. That's this emotion that we're seeing here in this letter from Paul. Uh, but he, this emotion and why he's calling them my children, it's not because, um, it's not because, um, that he gives birth to them or whatever. It's because he sees Jesus in them. Okay, Paul's emotional here. He's saying, my children, 
uh, my dear children. It's like he's personally giving birth, but it's not for him. It's because he's seeing Jesus in them, okay? He wants to see Jesus uh, in them right here in verse 19. Verse 20. I would like to be with you right now and change my tone of voice because I don't know what to do about you, okay? So he's saying I sound harsh in this letter, you know, as we've covered the last three weeks. It's, some of it sounded harsh in this letter, but I really love you. You're my kids. I want, I want, if I could see you, I wish we could talk face to face about this, okay? So it's Paul's deepest concern. Uh, Paul's deepest concern is seeing Christ in them. Seeing Christ in them. Next slide, Bo. A quote and a question. If ministers wish to do any good, let them labor to form Christ, not themselves in their hearers. And that's by John Calvin. And there's a question here. Are those who follow me becoming more like Jesus? Um, uh, something that I have to ask, something I'm sure Brother Vic asked, if you're a Sunday school teacher, GA leader, um, what we need is for, we need to labor to form Christ in them, not ourselves. And we need to ask ourselves, are those who follow me becoming more like Jesus? That's the test there, okay? So here, at this point, that is the end of the personal appeal. That's the end of the personal appeal here. And now next, the next few verses, we're wrapping up the doctrinal section of Galatians. Remember the outline, you had the personal, what was the first two chapters, the doctrinal, the two middle chapters, and then practical will start next week on the final two chapters. So this right here, this section we're about to read is going to finish up the doctrinal uh, section of Galatians. Paul wraps it up with a scriptural allegory. Some say this is the hardest passage in Galatians to understand. Uh, go ahead and throw that out there. Some say it's the hardest passion in Gal passage in Galatians to understand. When we read it, it sounds very strange. Uh, this is a very Jewish way of talking uh, as we read this, so just in preparation. I think we've got a good, good grip on it, and uh, we'll convey it pretty good. Verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? Okay? So you who want to be under the law, okay, you baby Gentile Christians, do you want to be under the law? Do you even know what the law is? Remember, they're Gentiles. They weren't born under the law. They weren't Jews, okay? So he's saying to them, you want to be under the law? You don't even know what the law is because you're Gentiles. You're not Jewish. It's what he's saying here. These Galatians were hybrids. Uh, they were like, give me a little Christianity and a little Judaism, Give me a little grace and a little law. Give me a little Jesus and a little circumcision. Okay? And Paul said that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Okay? It doesn't work that way. And here it's going to start. Paul starts with five real people. Five real people. One father, two mothers, and two sons. One father, two mothers, and two sons. So five real people is what he's going to use here. And it's doctrinal. He's getting it from the Old Testament, uh, the scripture, as he's making his argument here. Verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. Okay? So Father Abraham, father of the nation, okay, father of faith, Abraham had two sons. So one father... Okay, he had two sons by two women. One by a slave woman, who was who? Hagar. One by a free woman, which was who? Okay, Hagar had Ishmael and Sarah had Isaac. Okay, so that's what we're saying there. Verse 23, but the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born through promise. So the son by the slave woman, Ishmael, was born an ordinary way, by the flesh, meaning sexual relations, okay? But the son of the free woman, Isaac, okay, he was born due to a promise. I mean, Sarah and them were 100 years old. They didn't think they could have a kid, but God told them they would, okay? So here we see we have a slave woman who had a son by an ordinary way, by the flesh, sexual relations, 
Uh, and then we had a free woman who had Isaac, and it was basically a promise of God. It, it was a miracle of God to have a son uh, at their age, okay? So that's what we see there. So you got Abraham, one father, Hagar and Sarah, two mothers, Ishmael and Isaac, two sons. So Paul is really wanting to talk. What he's really wanting to talk about here is not very much about Abraham, not very much about the two sons. What he's really wanting to use here are the two mothers, the two moms. Sarah represents grace. Sarah represents grace and trusting God. Okay? It was a miracle for her to have a child at her age. So she represents grace and trusting God. Hagar represents the law. Okay? Doing it on your own okay, to help God out. All right? You know, Sarah couldn't have children. She was barren. She goes to Abraham and was like, you know, we can get you a son. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, when Hagar uh, conceived and had a son, they were trying to do it their own way. So she represents the law. Sarah is the line of faith. Hagar is the line of works. Sarah is the line of faith. Hagar, the line of works. From one man, from one man flows two lines of humanity. This, this, is, this is what's interesting. From one man flows two lines of humanity. Everyone in the world descended spiritually through Abraham. Okay? You are either spiritually descended by Hagar, which means by works, okay, and the law, or by Sarah, meaning faith and grace. Okay? So one man has two lines of humanity is what Paul's pointing out here. Hagar, under the law and by works. Sarah, under grace and faith. Verse 24. These things are being taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Okay? So where did the law, where did Moses get the law? From God. But what location? Mount Sinai. So we see here, one is from Mount Sinai and bears the law, okay, and bears children into slavery because their, their children are born under the law, okay? Slavery here. And this is Hagar. So he's pointing that out. Uh, so two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which is Hagar, bears children into slavery. Slaves become uh, slaves because they try to keep the law and please God, and they can't do it, as we've already talked about. Verse 25, now Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Mount Sinai in Arabia that corresponds to present-day Jerusalem. What Paul is saying here is, at this time, he's like, look at Jerusalem. Look at Jerusalem. You have a temple, and you're still bring, they're still bringing in animals. The priesthood is still there. Uh, people are still bringing their tithes. The whole system is set up there. But it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And everyone trying to get to heaven through that system will fail. They're in spiritual slavery. That's what he's saying here. He's like, look at present day Jerusalem. Look at the temple. They show up every day at this time bringing their goats, their bulls. Um, the system is set up. The priesthood is still there. And they're trying... Uh, to, to get to heaven or find favor with God by doing these things. And he says that's spiritual slavery, okay, when he's talking about Hagar here. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem above, so we have another Jerusalem, but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. So we have an earthly Jerusalem, okay, where the temple was, where they were coming in, doing their, doing their things, uh, trying to find favor with God. That's the earthly Jerusalem, Hagar. And now we have a Jerusalem above. This is the new Jerusalem. This is free. This is Sarah. Okay? This is Sarah. So the earthly Jerusalem is Hagar, under the law, under works. Uh, the Jerusalem above, okay, is that of Sarah, which is grace and faith. Verse 27. For it is written... Rejoice, childless woman, unable to give birth, burst into song and shout, 
You who are not in labor for the children of the desolate woman will be many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Okay? So verse 27, uh, really if you go back and look at Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, we see by faith, by faith Sarah received strength to conceive, even at her age. Okay? God made a promise, and the promise isn't just fulfilled in all the Jewish people. So God made a promise to Abraham, remember, that he'd have many descendants, right? Numerous as the stars, the uh, grains of the sand. Um, and so, but that's, that, that promise wasn't fulfilled just in the, in the Jewish nation, just in the Jewish people, okay? Ultimately, it was fulfilled spiritually in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people over the centuries who have believed God and become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So not, not only was that promise to Abraham of his descendants uh, because of the Jewish people, but ultimately it was because of everyone. Okay? Because of these, the, this line here. It was ultimately fulfilled because of the hundreds and hundreds of, of millions of people over the centuries who have believed God and become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 28. Y'all just hang with me and we'll finish this so we can stay on schedule. Verse 28. Now you too, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. Okay? So now he's saying, you brothers. Okay? You brothers and sisters. Um, you Galatians. Uh, remember, they're mostly Gentiles. He's saying, you are on the side of Sarah. Because they're Gentiles. They're not Jewish. They're not, they weren't born under the law. So they're, they're on the side of Sarah. They aren't Jewish. You weren't born under the law. You were free. You came from Sarah's line spiritually. Okay? The Judaizers are with Hagar. They believe you have to have this law. And you have to keep this law. So that's what he's saying there. Verse 29. But just as then the child born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the spirit, so also now. If you go back to the Old Testament in, the Genesis, in Genesis and you read the story of Ishmael and Isaac, you will realize that Ishmael, by the time uh, Ishmael was a teenager, Isaac had been born. Okay? So there was an age gap there. You kind of had a teenager uh, that was born of the slave woman, and then you kind of had uh, the young guy who was born of the real mom. And so you can imagine, uh, you go back and read that story, Ishmael persecuted Isaac. You can imagine as kids, they kids, they pick on them at school and stuff. That's probably what was happening here. So if you go back and read in the Old Testament in Genesis, that story of Ishmael and Isaac, uh, Ishmael was persecuting Isaac, okay? And Paul is saying the same is happening now. The Judaizers are persecuting Paul. So Ishmael, under the law, okay, and by works, persecuting Isaac, who is by grace and faith, just as the Judaizers, under the, under the law, under works, was persecuting Paul, who was a believer in grace by faith, okay? So it's the same way here is what he's saying in verse 29. Verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the, with the son of the free woman. So this is interesting. What does the scripture say? In the in Genesis story, what ended up happening to Hagar and Ishmael? They were kicked out, right? And what Paul is saying is just as Ishmael and Hagar, under the law, under the works, were kicked out, okay, we need to get rid of these Judaizers. We need to kick them out, get rid of them. That's what he's using here. Okay, so what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. Remember, there was so much... Um, so much trouble that Abraham told Hagar that she and Ishmael had to go and Hagar's thrown out. Um, how should we deal with the Judaizers? Throw them out, ultimately. Okay? I'm all about um, you know, getting together, seeing things, but ultimately, if we, if we can't get this right, throw them out. Okay? And remember, we, we've had this slide up there for a few weeks. It's better to divide over truth uh, than unite in error. So what he's saying is just as Ishmael and Hagar needed to go because they were persecuting Isaac, these Judaizers need to go, okay? Verse 31, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of a slave, 
but of the free woman. Okay? Brothers, we aren't children of Hagar. We come from the free woman. So here's what we got. Two sons. I'm in my conclusion now, so just hang with me. We're going to finish. Two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Two women, Hagar, who was a slave, and Sarah, who was free. So two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Two women, Hagar the slave and Sarah the free woman. We had two conditions. Hagar was fertile. Sarah was barren. So two conditions, fertile and barren. Two births. One from the fleshly desire when Abraham got with the slave woman. And one was God's promise. Two sons, two women, two conditions, two births. We have two covenants. The law under Hagar and grace under Sarah. We have two results. Slavery, if you're trying, if you're under the law, you're enslaved to that under Hagar. Or freedom under Sarah, which is what you get when you place your faith in Christ alone. And then we had two cities. We had an earthly Jerusalem, which was what Paul was saying is look at the temple. Look at the priesthood there. They're going through their motions every day. You're bringing the bulls and the goats. Um, you know, but that is not forgiving you of your sin. So we have the earthly Jerusalem for Hagar under the law, under works, doing good. And then you have the heavenly Jerusalem, which is from the free woman, Sarah, and that's from grace and faith. Okay, So Paul is saying, what Paul is saying here is make your choice. There's two lines of humanity um, that we're all under, and he's saying make your choice here. Make your choice. Next point, next slide, though. The key part, or the key point, is law and grace as a way of approaching God have nothing in common. Law and grace as a way of approaching God have nothing in common. Next slide. I want to show you this. You have Abraham, one father. You have two wives, okay, and two sons, and you see there. Under Sarah, she had Isaac because uh, God gave her the strength to conceive. It was a miracle by God. Uh, that, that promise was fulfilled. Uh, freedom and life on Sarah's side. Uh, she's a free woman, uh, grace and uh, faith. And then you got Hagar who had Ishmael, and they were under the law, okay? And they were slavery. You're enslaved to that law and, and ultimately have death, death there. So that's just a little... A little a slide there for you to look at. So Abraham is the father of two lines of humanity. You know, uh, when I was a teenager, I don't know if they still do it anymore, probably not, but we used to go, I don't even know, I don't even know where it came from, but I just said it because everybody that was cool said it. We used to walk around in the hall, we'd be like, who's your daddy? You ever hear that? You ever hear your kids or grandkids? You know, we walked through the hall, who's your daddy? You know, and it, you didn't even really, nobody really answered it. It was just kind of a way, you know, it was like, well, yeah, nod, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's part of my tribe. Who's your daddy, you know? He, right, right, all right. He knows. Uh, so the question uh, tonight is not, is not who's your father or who's your daddy. The question tonight is who's your mother. The point Paul is making here is it Hagar and the law and the works and slavery, or is it Sarah and the freedom and grace and faith uh, you can go to that next slide, but uh, so the question is not who's your daddy or who's your father. The question tonight, based on this two lines of humanity, is who's your mother. Three points, and I'm done. Number one, don't be surprised at the opposition you receive. Don't be surprised at the opposition you receive. And remember, unfortunately, a lot of times our greatest opposition are the religionists. Okay, uh, just as Christ. Uh, was basically condemned and convicted by the religious leaders. Sometimes uh, the religionists are our greatest opposition. So don't be surprised at the opposition you receive. Number two, don't envy the lost. Don't envy the lost. The Ishmaels of the world, okay, trust in themselves. The Isaacs of the world trust in God alone. The Ishmaels of the world, those who are trying to keep the law and do all the good works and fast here and take this bull here and take this goat here, uh, those are trusting in themselves to get those things done. But the Isaacs of the world trust in God alone. Don't envy the lost. And number three, don't shrink from speaking the truth. 
Don't shrink from speaking the truth. Speak the truth in love. Okay? Don't shrink from speaking the truth. Speak the truth in love. Brother Vic had a great sermon a couple weeks ago uh, where he uh, took actually two weeks in a row where he talked about the two greatest commandments, love God and, and basically love each other. And when we speak that truth, we have to remember about that love. We have to remember uh, to love when we speak that truth. I, I tell the youth, if you're driving through a school zone going 65 miles an hour, you obviously don't love the kids in that school, right? So whenever we're going through a school zone now, we've got to think about those, great, those two greatest commandments. If you really love those children that are in that school, you would go the speed limit in that school zone to keep them safe. That's why it's designed that way, okay? Um, so don't shriek from speaking the truth. Speak it in love. And this is what we need to do. We need to ask for the wisdom of God and the love of Christ. When we're dealing with a situation, when we have opposition, when we're needing to speak the truth to people who don't want to hear the truth, this is what we need to do. We need to ask God for wisdom, wisdom of God and the love of Christ whenever we're speaking that, whenever we're dealing with that, okay? That's chapter 4. I'm done. Any comments or questions before the women in the back kill me? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you next week. Chapter 5. We just got chapter 5 of chapter 6. Two more weeks. And my time is done. Um, hopefully this has been a blessing to you. Hopefully you've learned something or, or saw something that you haven't seen before. Um, that's our prayer. So let's pray. Father, we're truly grateful uh, for the fact that we come together, Lord, without a worry in the world. And sit here and try to read through your word. And, and, uh, and try to understand it and see what you're trying to tell us uh, tonight, Lord. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that we have done... Uh, done, done justice in that. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that you will open the eyes of our hearts, uh, open uh, our mind as we're trying to, to see what you're telling us. Give us the wisdom, the knowledge, the guidance to read your word and uh, to understand it and try to apply it to our lives. We're just thankful that you kept us safe while we were here tonight, Lord. We're thankful for the kids in the back that are learning more about you and we're learning more about your word. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll keep us safe as we depart here. We thank you again, and we just ask, Lord, that uh, you'll forgive us for our, our many sins uh, and where we fall short and uh, bring us back here safe and sound on Wednesday night. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Adios, folks. Thanks.